Namaskar. Namaskar it is now recording the session. Okay. Welcome to the St. Louis Unix Users Group. The initial presentation is going to be by Steve Stegman. Go ahead, Steve. All right, I'm going to go ahead and... Can you hear me? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Let's see. Pick which screen I want to share. All right, can you see this screen here? This team up? Yes. Screen? Okay. Yeah, we see your your team up screen and your background with the yeah. trees. Yeah, that's a picture out the back door of my office. That's the farm. That's a, that's one field on the farm. Anyway, um, is this font big enough? Anybody can read it. I can read it. Fine. Okay. Everybody but Lee. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gary. He spends 10 hours a day using TMUX, so, you know, wouldn't surprise me if he doesn't listen to this too awful close. Anyway, so I guess most people have heard of TMUX, but basically it's, I think of it as a, uh, like a terminal emulator. And it's pretty simple to start. Uh, what have I got running here? Somebody's running some water. Yeah, I don't know. Not me. Boy, if I have water running that loud down here, I'd better call, open the back door and let it out, you know? But it's pretty easy to start. Uh, all you got to do is just say TMUX. Boom, and it starts. Okay. And then to get out of it, pretty simple. You just go exit. When the shell that's running in the window goes away, the window goes away. And so TMUX LS tells me that I've got two sessions going. And so I'm going to. Yeah, I got rid of one. Okay, so we're going to attach back to that one. And oh, give me a break. There we go. And let's see. I. The, the, the main, the most important feature of TMUX is that if your communication goes dead, it doesn't hurt anything. You've got TMUX running on a host, you know, something, something, something or other, a, a remote server or something. It's, Lee uses TMUX to manage all his uh, remote servers, none of which have any graphics on it. At least I don't think they do. And TMUX doesn't do graphics. It probably can do curses. I have not actually tried it. So I'm not certain. But um, you can run Emacs in it. Bingo, there it is. But the important thing is when it... Uh, when you get disconnected from it and you do a control B and then a D as in David, and that disconnects you. And then if you do a listing, there's one and it's detached. It's, nobody's attached to it right now. So if I attach to it, these little uh, two character commands I'm running here, those are all, uh, We've loaded them onto um, our website. If you go to slug.org slash tmux underscore functions, they'll be there on the website. That should find it for you. So that'll give you a Midnight Commander. Go ahead, Stan. I'm sorry. Do you run Midnight Commander under Emux? That's in curses. 
application. Is it? It uh, seems to me that I've seen me run the Midnight Commander in Pmux. Can't swear to it though. And MC is how you get Midnight Commander. Just type MC. MC, Mike, Mike Charlie. No, Not installed. Okay. Installed. Yeah. Does it run VI? Oh, yeah, you can run VI in there. You can run Emacs. Yeah, VI is definitely end curses. VI or Vim? I think no. either one. I don't really know. Just installing Midnight Commander here. Boy, since I got rid of T-Mobile, life is so much better. I just got all my phones switched over to Verizon today. Holy cow, what a difference. MC. Yep, looks like it runs. There you go. How do I get out of it? PF10, uh, PF10. Or type quit. PF10. You have to type quit. The F ten key. No, 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 no. Function key F ten. Yeah. Okay. Uh, type quit. Q U I T. Oh, let's try that. You got to close that little drop down up there. Yeah, I know. And there you go. Oh, that worked. Okay. Oh, yeah. so, so it then does work. Got a, within. got a command line running at the bottom. I I've never actually used it before. Wait a minute. No, that didn't work. No, there. Um, you used to have a prompt at the bottom. Oh, there is prompt. Some, of the, some of the uh, uh, systems uh, kidnap the F10 that yeah. the midnight. Commander tries to use, and so it doesn't work. So you have to type quit or exit, or I forget. I think it's quit. Q U I T. There you go. Ooh. Might be Control X Q, according to this. That's quick view. Excuse me. Uh, try. Hmm. Well, it says function. Yeah, I, mean, I want to see the Control O. All right. Whew. Had me worried there for a minute. I've never used Midnight Commander. But uh, anyway, so if you get, if you disconnect formally, you know, by hitting Control B and then uh, a D for David, that disconnects you. And then you come back, you just type Tmux space A space, you know, the name of your session. In this case, it's desktop. If you don't give it a name, it's just going to be session zero, one, two, three, something like that. And uh, it'll automatically reattach. Let's see. Oh, yeah. If you've only got one session, just type Tmux attach. You don't have to be, if it only finds one running, it'll attach to that one. So, and this, uh, this is, this is pretty robust. It'll, uh, it'll maintain itself. You know, if you have a lightning strike or whatever, as long as the host you're running Tmux on is up, you can log back into it. Now, You see down here, this is my session name. See where it says desktop down in the lower corner? That's the session name. And it's also the very first character string on the line when you do a Tmux listing.
But that, I mean, that, that'll sit there. I've got a, um, a Raspberry Pi running over here that I never shut off, and it it Tmux holds a session for a month, no problem. So now the other thing, so we've got a session here, and its name is desktop. And you see down here, I've got three tabs. Reynolds, Euler, and Nusselt. Those are my three uh, desktop computers that I usually run. I've got several more, but, you know, I don't need them tonight. Right now, I'm running on Nusselt, and if I say... Now I switch back to, uh, oh yeah. Okay, that one's running on Reynolds, and if I do this, now it's on Euler. You notice the asterisk here, right after Nussle. We're running on Nussle right now, or logged in on Nussle, I should say. And... So that's why that asterisk is up there. It shows you which one you're attached to. Now, what I've done here is I'm actually running Tmux on my desktop computer. Strictly speaking, to make all this work, what you should do is you should log into your remote machine, like Muscle or Euler or Reynolds, whichever, you know, whatever you call it. And you run Tmux on that machine is where you type the Tmux. So strictly speaking, I didn't do it right. So what I should have done was go to SSH Reynolds Tmux. Now this Tmux is actually running on Reynolds. And this is the right way to do it. Um, if I lose connection, I can always log back into Reynolds and it'll tell me there's still a server running there. And uh, then I can just pop right back into it. But I'm running it here uh, just because it's a little easier for what we're doing tonight. But if I want to switch to, let's see, I want to put some of these commands up on the screen. I gave a file of this to Lee, but I can't find it back on the website. But anyway, I'll have it for you by the end of the night. So you want to um, switch from one window to the next. It's Control B N, and it just toggles from one to the next. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Control what? Uh, it's Control B, like Baker. Control B. And what is that? That's an attention command. It doesn't cause anything to happen. It just alerts Tmux that a command is coming. The next character is going to be a command. So if I want to um, go to the next window, I hit Control. You can't see any of this because it doesn't show up on the screen. But I hit Control B and an N, Nancy. And it moves to the next one. Control B and it moves to the next one. Now, it also has panes. What you're looking at here is we're on uh, Euler window or session, and this one's got three panes. And right now, you can see that it's active in the lower left pane. And if you look over here, I've named this pane with all my imagination. I've named it lower left. And if I switch to the next one, there you go. Now I'm running in the lower right. Switch to the other one, and now I'm running in, you notice down in the lower right-hand corner, it says I'm running in the upper pane. Again, you can name those panes anything you want. Um, it's kind of odd. The command that you have to do to uh, change the name, I found it on the web. There's got to be a better way to do this. But 
get back over here. All right, we're here. So here's what you what you do. You type print F and then I've never tried this. Let's just try it. Yeah, change the name. I don't uh, I haven't sat down and you know worked out it's an escape sequence that uh, changes the name of that pane. But what is that? Is that 33? Is that an escape? I don't remember. I used to know all this. I don't remember it anymore. I believe that is an escape. It's the kind of thing that they use to escape so they can plug colors into like. Uh, a base session of LS yeah, and that, color that and all that. Sense. I think that's that escape is. sequence is pretty common. It's the same escape escape sequence if you want to change the title bar on your X term. Oh, really? <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. Hang on a second. Yeah, I thought that looked familiar, but so I mean, it's nice that you can give these panes name, but I don't see anywhere in the pane where it says my name is. No, you don't. What you do see is watch this. You see this yellow line? I'm in the upper pane right now. Let's uh, give it its name back. Okay, so I'm in the upper pane. You notice this line right across here is in yellow, and it's highlighted. Watch what happens when I move on to the next one. Now I'm in the lower left pane, and you'll see that this part is yeah. This is green. I, it's not, you know, it's not a real attention grabber. I'll I'll. Not a real that. attention grabber, but it is trying to. Boy, that's a good question. If you if you just have an upper and a lower without a split like that, where I, the line's always going to be green. <laughs> Let's try it. How do you kill a pain? Let's see. Well, that didn't that didn't work. I got these commands from a couple different places and they don't seem to. Ah. Okay. Let's see. Oh, look at, see what it does, Stanford? When I'm in the upper pane, the left part, left part is highlighted. If I'm in the lower pane, the right part is highlighted. I'll do that one more time. Watch it. As I switch my my uh, yeah, you're right. right. I think I think I'd prefer to just know that the, wherever the curse wherever the block cursor is, that's where I am. Well, that's probably much easier to do. You know, I'm sure Tmux is written in curses. I might uh, I don't know. Instead of a horizontal line, maybe use a line of I don't know something. I mean, you got the you got the same problem when you have multiple um, windows in Emacs. It's like, well, which window am I typing in? It's like, go look where the cursor's active. Yep. Yep. That's the only way you can tell. So that's that's really about uh, reasonably well covers it. The, uh, the tabs are down here. Those are the windows. And the session name that you picked up is over here. So if I disconnect with a control D, where are we at there? Oh, I gotta have, I have to be sending my commands to that window. So, 
Oh, as long as that sir, one thing I just now noticed, as long as that server's been running, it's been running since midnight last night. Every time I create a session, this session number over here on the lower left-hand corner uh, increments. So sessions, you know, one, two, and three are gone. But it's keeping track of how many it's created. So if I say Tmux A4, Yeah. So. But it works pretty good. I haven't had a let's see if Vim works. Yep, looks like Vim is going to work just fine. Generally speaking, anything that'll work in a normal ASCII terminal window will work here. The other thing it's really good for is if you've got something, you got maybe some kind of a logging program or something that you started. Uh, if you disconnect from the session, that keeps running. That's the other thing that, that's handy is, uh, you know, when you come back to your session, it's doing whatever it was doing before. Um, if you're doing a bunch of uh, server maintenance, then when you come back, bring that session back up, you can see what you were doing. Now, some of you guys probably have wonderful memories and that's irrelevant, but not for me. I need to see what I was doing, otherwise I'll, it'll take me an hour to get, you know, get back to that. How extensive is the help file on this thing, the man page? Never looked at it. Well, there it is. Oh, it's a Berkeley. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Clearly, I have not but scratch the surface. Brief, this is like Emacs. Two thousand lines. Author Nicholas Marriott. Yeah. Do you know him? No, I'm just wondering. I was expecting it to be one of the names. I was expecting it to be Stallman, but <laughs> he would he would have done enhanced Emacs instead of writing Tmux. I think that that there's a program out there that does very similar to this, but the commands are different. And it's called Screen. I was going to ask about Screen. Yeah, Lee's got Screen running on a couple of his really ancient machines. And, it, you know, it, it accomplishes the same thing. <clears throat> and uh, two things about Screen that I don't know that it has splitting the panes. They both have the feature of you can disconnect and and we ne and then when you lose your internet, then you can come back in and you can reconnect to the screen that's still running and keep and holds your place. They both provide that feature. Yeah, the screen that's, that's... also allows two people to visit the same screen, so one of you can type while the other one watches what's going on. Lee and I do that every once in a while, and Tmux does the same thing. Okay. I want to set up a reverse tunnel between his the bat cave and my dump and uh so it looks like t much if t mux is richer and we'd have to do some investigation to find out if it's got a heavier footprint yeah i don't know uh wait a minute hang on now let's do a search for Tmux. Hmm. 
need to make this a little bit bigger here. Well, its virtual memory is, I guess, 30K. Let's just search for Emacs. Mag. <laughs> yeah, you need to run screen, a, though, if you have it on there. Yeah, Emacs is, is third. So this is, uh, this is only 30K. So it's, it's pretty small. It is. And I don't know what, I don't know what screen is, but 30K, whether if, if well, screen's only 20K, it's like, those are the same number. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's so small. And in today's world, it's irrelevant. Now, you know, it depends what you're running inside of it. Sure. You know, and, um, you know, so if you, I don't think you can run a browser in there. I, you can probably run an ASCII browser. Like, is that, you know, not Pine. Um, Links? Yes. Yeah, you could probably run an ASCII browser in it. But when it comes time to display a picture, it's just not going to work. I wonder if it would work with Ranger. Ranger has a, a way to display uh, some some graphics. Ranger, what's that? It's kind of a a command line type of uh, uh, menuing system. It's uh, oh. well, you can run anything you want in here. You know what? Well, the thing is, what whatever you launch in at the command line, if it's if it's X based, it's going to start an X window, and it's going to start an X window back on your X server, <laughs> wherever you came from. I mean, it it you know X servers. It's we're not talking VNC or RDP here. X is a completely different beast. You go over to a re remote machine and you run an X command, and it doesn't run. You know. Yes, it runs locally, but it doesn't display locally and screens are sent back to where you came from. It displays back where you came from. Right. So if I do SSH minus X and I go to Reynolds and do Emacs, if I could spell it. See, Emacs throws, throws it right back. That's an X. Sure. And so the question would be, right back. so if you lost your internet connection, Tmux would stay running, but the X, which is displaying the Emacs, which is displaying back, would drop because because your X connection was not yeah. tunneled through the Tmux. Yeah. Right. So this blue window I've got here, I'm fundamentally logged into a machine called Reynolds, and if I run Emacs here, oh, look at that. I didn't expect that. Well, but that's, I mean, that's a good question. Where is it running? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Where, where is it displaying? That's the point. You gotta, you gotta do an X Dippy info. You have to go ahead and start Emacs and put it in the background. Emacs ampersand. Oh, here's, okay, here's, here's what happened. When I logged into Reynolds, I yep. did minus X. Now I start yep. Tmux, and if I start Emacs in Tmux, it picks up the X from the from the parent. Yeah, and you can see that um, it, it control Z your Emacs and put it in the background. Wait a minute, how do you do that? Control V. Control Z. Well, oh, that wait a minute. Handles. No, no, hang on, hang on. Control Z. There we go. BG. Yep. X D P Y I N F O. X D P Y N F O. X D P Y D P Y I N F O. Eric, your turn, and now go 
and you get it and now go whoa that's supposed to supposed to give you a crosshair to you go ask it where do you want the info of um there's a way to scroll the tmux window no there's a way to ask x where is this window running and i, I thought it was x dippy info but it's i I'll, I'll come back to me in the next lecture yeah <laughs> i hear that yeah, and then you go, then you go click on the X, you go click on the X display, and where you ran X Dippy info, it says, oh, that that window that you just clicked on, here's all the information I know about that window. Like it ain't running here, it's running over there. Yeah, yeah, interesting. The um... X try X Win info instead of Dippy info. X Win info. Yeah, now go put the crosshair in, in the Emacs session and click, and it'll say, here's the information about the window that you just clicked on, and hopefully it'll tell you what host it's, what the display name is. Yeah, I know. Emacs I, at Reynolds. Well, that's yeah. it. Doesn't give you the display name. Doesn't tell you what dollar display is set to. Emacs at Reynolds. All right, that's yeah, that's okay. We're over time though. The Emacs is running on Reynolds, but it's displaying on Euler. We've got no time limit here, folks. Yep. Okay. Did do we do we have another uh, a main session tonight? No, not really. Okay, no, we don't. We'll, so we'll just go to go. the X. Go to Just Emacs go and get a shell. General Q and A. Get a shell, and Echo Dollar Display. <laughs> yeah, local host ten because it, it. But that I think that's that the local host ten means you came in through an SSH. <laughs> now let me just do that over here. I've I've got an, I've got another Emacs. Wait a minute. Okay, this this Emacs is running purely on Euler. Ah. Zero point zero. Yeah, it's local. It's totally local. <laughs> right. Yeah, this this one here is totally local, and it's now. Well, that's interesting on Euler. So, how are now? I'm curious. How are you logged into Euler? Um, all right, the desktop you're looking at here, okay. This picture of my farm. Yep. That's running on Euler. Okay, that makes sense. And if you bring up, you can see in the title bar the Emacs. Is it? I mean, title bars can be manipulated, but one of them says Emacs at Reynolds, and the other one said Emacs at Euler. Yeah. If I start one purely local, it says Emacs at Euler, and the, this one is the one I started from Reynolds. It's just throwing its window back to e Euler. Yeah, if I type host name, bingo. Well, we are pretty far down the rabbit hole now. We like rabbit hole. This thing works pretty well. What is the name of that oh application on um, oh, SUSE that they do they do all their wait a minute I got it running here someplace. That was the question. I've got I'm gonna kill these Emaxes. For sure. Okay, if I come over to this window, which is running on Faraday. Oh. Yeah, this is a this is a curses window. It's running on a machine called Faraday. And so it's, does, does Yast always do curses, or did it detect that there was no X server and go to curses mode? Well. There is a, well, I can't really show you, but there is a GUI version of Yast. 
Okay. okay. And frankly, I like the versus version better. And it has the advantage that it can, you know, it doesn't need graphics. Right. That it's easier to do remote administration. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's the whole thing. If you're doing remote administration, this is the way to go. Let's see. Well, if you're doing a, I'm becoming a big fan of, uh, oh, what was it called? Um, Webmin. What's that? Uh, web admin, web administration. Oh, okay. W e b m i n, but it's it, you, you install it on the machine you want to manage, and then it listens on a, a port, and then you just connect your browser to that port, and you're adminning that box. Yeah, there's probably fifty different things like that. What's yeah? Let's see. That's the same. Dep I mean, depends on whether you like point and click admin or scripted admin. Okay. I just SSH to Reynolds from inside Tmux. And let's see. Let me get out of here. And here's the command I used. So doing that from inside Tmux looks like it works pretty good with X Windows. Um, but when you X, I'm sorry. So question is, can you go over to Reynolds or whatever, start an X session, start a, a you know an X session, an Emacs, whatever, and then suspend <laughs> that Tmux session, and and you know, I'll keep the X session running for you. I have not tried that. But and the, well, and the answer is running. I will. Yeah, I already know the answer. The answer is I will try to keep that X session running for you as long as the network stays up. Well, you know, if you're running Tmux on a machine and you you know you like SSH minus X to that machine, and you run Tmux and then you run an X app inside there, it's going to throw the window back to wherever you are. Um, and if you lose that connection, uh, let's see. This one. No. Okay, I got one running here. I run into next. You didn't I SSH did. with an X. Yeah, and you forgot to do that little detail. Okay, two months. Okay, here, now if I run Emacs. Okay, now let's say I'm going to suspend. The Emacs is the, the X window is still here. Actually, the X window still looks alive. It'll, like I said, it'll keep it alive as long as the internet connection that X is dependent upon stays healthy. Yeah, it looks like it's, uh, let's see. Yeah. It won't, whereas Tmux will, you can lose your internet connection and Tmux will. I don't even want to say cache your last state. That's not the point because Tmux is running on the remote machine. You're just not attached to it. A question, Steve. Does that Tmux space LS, does that show you all the, T, uh, the uh, T, uh, Tmux sessions that are, it knows of? Well, all right, see, now right now I'm on Euler. And if I do right. a T Tmux LS, what it tells me is I have one, one uh, session or one server running on Euler. Okay? Right. And if I attach to that one,
It's got three windows and one of those right windows. Right Max Space LS there, if you will. Sure. Wait a minute. Uh, T Mux is not running on that machine. Yeah, that's that's not. Mm. Oh. That's interesting. You know, it's amazing how complicated this stuff can get really sh easily. You know, I'm going to get another window here. Oh, you think this is complicated? Wait till I get the call for help. What? <laughs> Keep talking, Steve, or we're in big trouble. <laughs> Uh, Reynolds got a whole bunch of stuff running. And you did that with the TA option, or what? How did you sh how did you show that list? Tmux space LS. Yeah, that what that does it just gives you a listing of the sessions running. In this case, running right on Reynolds. See, I've got some running over there. Okay. Um, do the up arrow for the zero again, but I think you need a minus T in front of that zero. Yeah, I think you probably do. And it may have to be attach dash session. The word attach may not be enough. Yeah, well, attach by itself isn't going to be enough here. Is the T A an alias? Yeah, that's it. It, it, um, it. Evidently, it's not so much an alias stand as it is a bash function. Okay. But I'm not sure I can explain the difference between an alias and a function. <laughs> Except an, an alias is just substitute one set of characters for another set of characters, whereas a function's got all this parameter oh, substitution. Well, and, oh, yeah. I, here, I've been, here's a simple function. Hang on a second. I'll throw one up on the screen. All right, right here. See this? Go. Yeah, function that's TL, a function. That's a bash function. Right. Okay, if you put that in a file and you can source it into bash or, you know, dot it into bash, whatever you want to do. You can just call it TL because it's a function. Yeah. Right. I don't have any of these functions actually up and running on on this. I haven't I haven't synced my. Uh, I've got one file that's got all of these functions and stuff in it, and I haven't synced it on my desktops recently. I need to get off my dead <laughs> and do that. You lost your cursor. Where are you? Pardon? You've lost your cursor. Where are you? I hear somebody typing. Oh, you see, I threw that in there. Yeah. That that function is now live on Reynolds. Right. As long as that shell's up, it'll go away when that shell goes away. Let's see. How do you kill something? Ah, here we go. And imagine you can put that function in your base or scene somewhere. Yeah, that's what I do. Or, or base underscore something. On my machine, it's it's called Steve's Functions. Strangely enough, I have yeah. such imagination. Sometimes and, uh, best not to have any imagination. Just document, document, document. Yeah, really. When my with my memory, or you know. Any more questions, Stanford? Not for TMUX. What? Why did 
Give me that. Uh. Hmm. I think you left the T to the U out of hey. T box. Yeah, I spell the name of the fun of the program wrong. It pretty much guaranteed not to work. See, there's only one left. Can we go ahead and kill that, or I'll be wondering what the hell. Yeah, I see it. <clears throat> when there's nothing there, it just says no server running. So that must be the location in the file system where it builds itself when it is running. And like you said, if you start a new one now, it'll be number five because that's the way it. Uh... Nope. No, once I killed all of them. Yeah, once you kill all, it's just like the TTY, the PTTYs, right. It, it, it takes the, it gives you the one beyond the most highest numbered one that's currently active until you, until you clear the queue. Yeah. When you kill the last one, it just resets that number. I mean, it's the same thing with, 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 with all of your background jobs, percent zero, percent one, percent two, percent three. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's the same thing. Hmm. Hey, Leeds, you ever show up? Yeah, bud, I've been watching. Oh, okay. We have no co-host. Yeah, you ought to make Stan a co-host or something. Got got oh, Lee, I, I, I forgot one thing that just now occurred to me. I want to have to find out how you scroll this TMUX window. Uh, I just use a scroll bar on a mouse. Since you're in X windows, it'll transfer to the screen. Mm, not really. See what it's doing? My wheel is just, uh, you know, going back through the history. Huh, doesn't do it on mine. Um, you can try shift page up and, and and shift up arrow and left down arrow. I mean, I would think that up arrow and down arrow would would do the the history, but shift up arrow and shift down arrow might scroll the screen. No, I'm just wait a minute. no, I'm trying it. It doesn't. Okay. I'm sure it'll be in the man page. Let's take a look. Well, you're running bash, then bash up at the top where it says file and edit. I forget which one of them it allows you to uh, set the scroll bar, scroll bar somewhere uh, under the, might be under file or settings. I know I've done that, but I don't remember exactly where it is. Oh, that's right. There's no scroll bar on here, is there? So, Lee, you're saying that you can scroll the TMUX window. Uh, okay, back up a second. You can scroll a shell window. If you're in a T TMUX window, you have to hit the attention key and then page up, page down. For me, it's a control B. That's what I use. Oh, is that? All right. So, the control B. Oh, yeah, there it is. And, and if you it's if you want to do p two pages up, it's control B page up, control B page up. You have to preface each page up with a break. Actually, no. what, what's funny here is I hit control B, and then just start going page up, and it keeps working. Oh, right. what, what, once you hit control B and then up an up navigation key, it'll it'll scroll in a buffer. If when yeah. you're done, you hit control C to get out. Or you, you hit control C to get out of control B. If yeah, you're in scroll back mode. 
Oh, only for the scroll back. Okay. All right. I know. Yeah. B is attention, and then you go into these other modes, and then you. Okay. Yeah, that actually works pretty nice. I'm going to add that to this file. Oh, Lee, the um, yeah. when I look on the uh, website, I go to. Ah. Wait a minute, let me pull this browser over here where you can see it. Tmux functions. I get the contents of that file. So somebody can do that. But the I can't get the other file I sent you. When did you send that file, Steve? No, I, I, I posted, well, uh, you got to put the right name in there. Well, yeah, I, okay. So what's that other one? That is, uh, I don't know. You gave it to me. Well, actually, Steve sent it to discuss list and discuss list didn't transmit it. No, but of... once we figured that out, I gave it, I sent it directly to Lee. Okay. That, okay. That looks better. There you go. Yeah, that didn't do anything useful. Well, that's the presentation you, you put up there. You sent me two files, the one you're looking at and the presentation. Oh, so if I want to see the presentation, I have to save it on my own machine and then open it. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. All right. uh, if only because you don't have a browser that understands ODT format. Yeah, that's my problem. Although I'm not aware of any browser that does, but. <laughs> yeah, no, that, yeah, there it is. Yep, that's it. I knew I was missing Get those something. Mozilla folks working on that. I'm sorry? I'm telling Stanford to get Mozilla to work on that. <laughs> um. I guess it's the Mo whatever the Mozilla. It's it, it yeah, whatever. I mean, the, like I said, I, there's several different browsers out there. Um, Scott Graneman did a very nice talk that I didn't memorize on the the three basic engines that are underneath every browser. <laughs> well, I imagine Vivaldi. Let's see. Well, I'm running just a scan. I'm running the the uh, Firefox and. That kind of file, it would give you the option to either download it or to run LibreOffice to to run the thing in in memory. Oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, like, like I said, it, it depends whether the bra all the different incantations of is the browser aware of that kind of file extension and have an application that'll read it. And I use the word file extension. I'm not even sure it's a file extension. It's probably a magic number. I gave it the option to save or open. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I had something else up there and screwed it up. Yeah, I mean, I found out that some browsers are tar are a tarball aware. You you go visit a web page that's got a TGZ file in it, and your browser will say, "Yeah, you want you want to look inside." <laughs> uh, I never know. That's amazing. Let's see what happens if I hit open. Oh, it goes gets a copy of. Uh... But it saves the copy into RAM and runs LibreOffice, and LibreOffice extracts it. That mm. so is yeah. magic. Well, that's handy. So, what didn't he do right the first time? I had he was in a hurry. Open. I had some other trash on the screen, and it screwed everything up. 
or you he was in a hurry and he, he pressed the first option was oh was uh, to download it i think instead of uh open it so vivaldi is back at the top of the list yeah who gave that talk on those browsers that one night that was pretty good <laughs> Granaman, I think. Scott Granaman. Okay. Did we record it and post it? Uh, how long ago was that? What did you say, eight to ten months ago, Gary? Uh, it seems about right. I, I would think maybe it was January or February, maybe. Hmm. Yeah, he, it was interesting. He said, yeah, he's yeah, at I don't know which is the Emacs of browsers. I don't know if it was the Wednesday meeting or the Thursday meeting, or all of our recordings just all smushed together in the library, or are they separated by which Linux meeting they took place during? How are our archives? Well, go, go to the, the main page of uh, slug.org. And on the right hand side is the archives listing. And they just or are they just archived by date? Just yes. scroll back until you, yeah. Yes. And every date of the week it happened, that's where it's archived. Right. And that's only for the Slug or the St. Louis Linux groups. Yeah, all four of them or whatever. Well, I don't post any of the Slack and New Linux recordings. Okay. How big are those yeah. files, Stan? Hell, I don't know. Go, 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 go to the, the browser, bring up St. Louis.org main page, and look. I usually list in the, the key key point there, what do you call it, uh, the size of the file. Yeah, okay. They vary. Some of them are 340 megabytes, some of them are 1.2 gigabytes. This depends. You know, what would govern that? The the, uh, pixel, the pixel size or the amount of screen changes that took place? Uh, and mostly it's the quality of the recording, and, and, and which is based upon somewhat up on the the uh, camera that's being used uh, and, you know it just it's all magic i don't know are they what are they are they mp4 files is that what they end up being yeah most of them some of them are AK, mkv and for the most part i try to convert them uh, i started trying to, to record them as mp4 instead of mkv which is a little bit larger, but it's more universal. Right. For different browsers, as near as I can tell. By the way, that uh, Scott by uh, talk by Scott Graneman on browsers that was in October of last year, and it was at the Wednesday general meeting. It was the main talk. So it was 11 months ago. I was a little bit off. <laughs> is, there a, a, is there a recording for that, Gary? Uh, let me double check. I thought I saw that, but let me check. That was a oh. Zoom meeting, wasn't it, back then? Yeah, they were all. Okay. Where did you get, where did you look it up, Gary, in your, in your little handy dandy paper wheel book in your hip pocket? No, no, but I, I just told everybody, you go to slug.org, the main page, and on the right-hand side is the archive listing. But Gary found it some other way. No, no he didn't. I, I found it exactly that way. Okay. If Steve will display the browser and go to slug.org, let me do that. Everybody would see it. Well, it's just that Gary yeah. stuttered when you said, "Is there a recording of it?" And Gary had to say, "Well, let me go look." And it's like I thought he was just there. <laughs> Well, I, I was just there, but then I flipped back over to Zoom and I let the Zoom screen show over the top of the, uh, but no, it, it, there is a recording. It's an MP4. Okay, now we're on the screen. Yeah, on a Mac, uh, Zoom does a whole, like the, the Zoom session when it's screen sharing, 
takes over a workspace. So you have to kind of flip back and forth between them. On the right side of the screen, down at the right-hand corner, it says presentation archives. Go down there. Too far. Too far. Ah. Ah. Okay. Okay. Up the top, you can jump to two, 2010 if you want. Oh, oh I see. So that you can jump, the table of contents will take you to different chapters in the archive. Right, 2020, whatever it was. We're almost there, February, what happened, January, December, October, there it is! Scott Graham. The, the worldwide world of browsers. Oh, yeah, it says link to 437 meg of video. Okay. Which may or may not be accurate. It depends whether I was awake or not when I, when I should have put in the actual size count or not. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So now that we've found it, let me recommend to anybody listening tonight who was not there last October, definitely go watch this movie. It was well worth it. Yeah. Lee, I'm going to send you another copy of that uh, Tmux presentation file. I added how to scroll a window. I can't believe I forgot that. All right. If you send it to editor, editor can add it to the archive list there. Good. You may notice that some of these entries have PDF, and those are usually the, the PDF file of the presentation, or it could be even an ODT file or whatever. That could be added. Send it to editor. Well, I've got an ODT file. Let me convert it to a PDF. So Stan, I see that the basic and the mains are split in the archives. Do you record them as one? Not, not, not always, not always. Some of them, they're, they're all lumped together. It just depends. So it is, you don't record them as one and then split them in two. It's like, well, whatever way I recorded no. them, that's the way I publish them. Right. I think early on, I, I tried to do them separate, and it didn't. It wasn't uh, necessary. All a learning process. Okay, I just sent the PDF to editor. Thank you. I take it editor doesn't strip off the attachments? Correct. Editor's an email address, it's not a list. Ah. And there are multiple people that can read that. Yeah, I see for December it says combined, and it's it's probably too much of an effort to put a comment in there to say main meeting begins at tick mark, 30 minutes and 54 seconds. If you'd like to volunteer, we could let you do such things. I was just going to suggest, why don't you do that, Stanford? Next presentation file has been received. Someone has surrendered the screen. I just took it back. If somebody's got something else they want to put up here, we can certainly do that. Well, you might as well turn it over to Gary. And as long as you got the website up, bring up the calendar and let's get going. 
Oh, wait a minute. I just killed the browser. Oh, boy. Just put slash calendar. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, while he's doing that, uh, yes, no, welcome to Cam and Dad. Yeah, I got it. I can't spell. Welcome to the monthly St. Louis Unix Linux Users Group meeting. This is the general meeting. And, uh, What'd you do, Stan? Switch recordings? No, I, I, I asked Steve to turn it on when Stan got, got there, but he didn't, so we're recording now. I'm recording with the uh, Namus Coward Simple Screen Recorder. So that is, and I started that about 6.40 or so. Okay. I'm sorry, Lee, I thought you said, tell Stan it's not recording. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Anyway, hopefully we have a recording here. Of it, so. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, we uh, normally this is the gooey middle of the meeting, uh, and we have a, a, a second, usually longer presentation later in the meeting. But uh, uh, this month, unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but this month we do not have a a second presentation tonight. So. Uh, uh, the the rest of the meeting here will consist of whatever announcements we have, and then uh, uh, general Q and A and comments. So just whatever uh, uh, whatever people want to explore. And uh, uh, so this may go a while, or it may be short. We'll see what people have. And uh, if anybody wants to bet that Stanford can keep the meeting going, well, I think we got a good bet there. <laughs> but. I didn't realize this is the 55th anniversary of Star Trek. And there we go. There's the first announcement of the evening. <laughs> yes, this is the 51st anniversary of Star Trek. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, starting uh, actually starting just uh, uh, five minutes ago, uh, there is actually an online uh, uh, online two hour uh, show. Uh, you can also get it on Paramount Plus, uh, but uh, uh, so whenever we break up, as I say, it's a two-hour show, so it'll be going until 9:30 tonight. Uh, I posted the URL for the show in uh, in the discuss email, uh, so if you want to go, you can pick it up there. Let's see other things going on. Let's see what other things going on here. Um, Thirteen. Oh, yes. Uh, the 13th, you say, or the 14th? 13th. Uh, Michigan. The Michigan log is on the 14th. Uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're, for some reason, Stan, the front of your syllable was being chopped off there. But uh, next Tuesday, uh, September the 14th, if you look on the calendar at 630, there is the Michigan user group meeting. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, first off, this is the first time I think we've had them on our calendar, but uh, oddly enough, their topic for next month is TMUX, or for, I'm sorry, for next week, is TMUX. So if you didn't get enough TMUX tonight, uh, and I wonder who their presenter is going to be, have you been holding out on us? Are you going to do a presentation for Michigan next week? <laughs> I have not actually been asked. <laughs> Well, anyway, it, it'll be a, a chance to compare and contrast and maybe learn a little bit more about TMUX. Uh, I don't know uh, how much, uh, you know, if it'll be uh, more cursory or, uh, uh, but anyway, it'll be, I'm sure it'll be interesting. So, uh, hey, Gary, is that the uh, Michigan Users Group in, that's in the Detroit area of the state? Uh, let's see. Good question. Uh, it's been there for quite a while. It's been a Unix users group, yeah. and then it was a Linux users group. Yeah, I mean, it just it's says it's a user group. It doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you what they use. What do you mean, what they use? 
Do they use Perl? Do they use Python? Do they use Java? Do they use Windows? What do they use? All of them. Well, maybe we try to dial in. They got the. Know, Ed, where is uh, where is two oh eight four four four? Oh, is that the area code two oh eight? Yeah. No, I have no idea. That's a, that's a website. Eight eight by eight is, if I remember correctly, is a, a GC kind of thing. I noticed their presenter is working in Ann Arbor, so that doesn't mean necessarily yeah, the group. And Ann Arbor is a, a University of Michigan, and so that's where uh, that's over on the east side of the state, close to Detroit. Steve, if you go up to the top of that little blurb and click on the www.mug.org, it'll pop up their web page. Which I just did. And their web page says a Michigan-based Linux and Unix free and open source community. We're getting a little more specific now. Yes. We know we're in Michigan. <laughs> it doesn't really say where they are. If they're on the web, I guess it doesn't really matter. At this point, thanks to the uh, pandemic, the world is getting to be a closer place. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, so uh, that's Tuesday of next week. Uh, Wednesday of next week, uh, at 9 a.m., uh, uh, there's a uh, uh, talk uh, about a uh, uh, cybersecurity framework that's actually been put together by NIST, the National Institute of Standards. Uh, Steve, go back to the... St. Louis Unix page. I have to ask a Michigan question first, Ed. Is, it, is that in the Eastern or Central time zone? All of Michigan is in the Eastern time zone. So yeah. if they don't have, um, so you they know. Gave a date, they gave a time when they start, time, but they uh, didn't tell them what time zone they were in. Yeah, they're going to be an hour uh, earlier for you guys. Phil Bunch posted that they're in Farmington, Michigan. Yeah, it's probably Farmington Hills, which is, uh, that's where Robert Sitek used to live, as a matter of fact. Well, I wish again, I was in Michigan. Okay, we'll have to adjust the time on the calendar then. To... Why can't we just all speak UTC? Yeah. Mm hmm now, By the way, I don't know if, if uh, I, I hate to go off on a tangent, but uh, if you all remember the the uh, Iran hostage crisis uh, that kind of ended the Carter administration. Ted uh, Koppel. Yeah, and they, they actually had that solved. They had a deal in place and the diplomats had all agreed they were gonna release the hostages. And the thing is, is uh, something had to be done by midnight or whatever time it was problem is is the diplomats did not specify midnight where and so the time <laughs> seriously i mean world history would be completely different <laughs> except that they didn't tell which time zone and it you know people got pissed off and so he's damn ignoring us we're leaving <laughs> that you know that just sounds like a state department snafu mm-hmm mm -hmm. I think we ought to defund the State Department. Ah, boy. <laughs> I'm all anyway. for that. Or at least give them all a pay cut. There you go. Like a 90% pay cut? That sounds great. Well, I actually heard some belly aching a couple months ago that the State Department is understaffed. I mean, I don't exactly know whether it was funding cuts or political turmoil, but they were complaining that they don't have enough people working in the State Department to process all the passport requests. That is standard procedure. Ask for more money and more people. You can justify your jobs by how many people you supervise and how big your budget is. It justifies whether you're a GS-13 or a GS-14 or 15 or whatever, or GM level. Woohoo! I read yeah. that for Uh, Not anything different. Anyway, traveling on. Uh, 
Let's see. Uh, also on Wednesday of next week, uh, Wednesday evening, uh, the CIA log, that's central Iowa. Uh, that's not the other CIA. Uh, but uh, uh, those guys always have some good topics. I don't know if they've picked a topic for next week. Uh, we haven't noticed it yet if they have, but uh, uh, it's a good one to tune into. They occasionally come and visit our meetings, so they're a good one. Uh, let's see. Thursday of next week is our lug meeting. Uh, the, uh, the topic next week is going to be, uh, uh, the basics of serverless, uh, and, uh, uh basically go down to 16 September and click on the St. Louis Unity Street. Oh yeah, I'm, I was on the wrong line. I'm sorry. Anyway, there are buzzwords that go along with serverless, like Lambda functions, uh, cloud function. Uh, basically, what serverless is, it's a uh, if you can write a very, very tight piece of code, so you get in under time limits and, and memory limits, uh, you can basically run for free out in the cloud. And uh, so uh, that's becoming a major, major effort for big corporations rather than you know, having their own servers running or paying AWS or uh, Microsoft or Google for having these cloud servers. Uh, you, can, you can get a lot of stuff done for almost nothing, uh, but you got to be able to write tight code to do it. Uh, so, uh, so Frank is going to explain what the ins and outs of that are and where it's useful. So uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's uh, one of the up and coming things in the industry. So be good to catch next week i don't know if i was running aws i think i'd put some code out there to trap that stuff and shut it down unless you want to pay me of course well and that that you know we're gonna to have to ask frank next week you know why you know why why do the big three you know allow this to happen you know and i'm sure he'll have some explanations of what the uh, economics of it is for everybody uh, let's see some other things coming up. Uh, do, 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 do. Ah, even though COVID goes on, there is the balloon glow and the Great Forest Park balloon race. It's uh, the 17th and 18th next week, uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, if you can catch COVID from from another balloon, there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why they decided it could go ahead. So uh, going to the last week of the month, uh, 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 starting on the 29th and going through the first, there's the Linux Security Summit. Uh, it's being held in Seattle, Washington, but I believe there's uh, uh, you know, an online uh, ability to, uh, to get into it. Uh, so... Yeah, it says join in person or virtually. Mm-hmm. And then on the 30th uh, through the 2nd, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the Strange Loop uh, Conference is uh, once again being held here in St. Louis. That's an annual event. Uh, always a good technical conference. And uh, 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 I'm not totally sure. What's it say there? Is there, is there a virtual version or is it only in person? Uh, there is a virtual version. There it is, yep virtual attendee page. Now, so, is that strange uh, loop as in sophisticated physics, or is it, am I missing something? Uh, programming. Technology. Uh, Tech, yeah. Tech. Programming, so, database, cloud. And uh, sometimes bash and vim. Yeah, besides. <laughs> I've never known how they came up with the name Strange Loop. I just pre presumed it meant you know, loop of code. But... No, Strange Loop is in a Moebius strip. Oh, okay. Okay. All righty. Um, anything else we need to point out um, uh, coming up on the calendar? 28th September. September is a new lug. Okay. New Linux. Very good. Did you say 28th? Oh, there it is. I see it. What do you say? Little red thing there. Yep, I see it. I see it. 
All our sponsored meetings are shown in red. Cool. All right. Anything else uh, from the calendar or uh, other announcements no. that uh, people want to make? Not hearing any, so we'll move on to general Q and A. And gee, I wonder who might have a question. Uh, gee, Stanford. Uh, you oh, guys, he by the way, raise his hand first. No. <laughs> I, I should say I think Stanford has a few questions for us. So if, if anybody else, uh, you know, don't feel intimidated because if we, you know, if you know, by all means say, hey, I got a question too, and. and We'll, we'll let everybody get in a few questions here tonight, but uh, uh, maybe everybody else should go first. Well, that could be. Anybody got a question they want to get in before Stanford? My <laughs> hands raised. Oh, okay. Uh, need to restore my single MySQL database. The only backup I have is a copy of the directory from the old from a backup. What's the simplest way to create a dump file from that and then use that to restore that database on the production system? Eek. When I when I ported um, the Redmine database with MySQL, whatever, you just get put just drop that file in place and MySQL will find it and you're done. <laughs> right, but the problem here is there's 20 other databases on the on that machine. So I can't just drop the folder in because it might blow something up. I need to create a dump file from it first. Okay, so you need a you need a little uh, you know a little VM someplace where you can drop that file in and then export the 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 database. Well, although, uh, what if I take a version of my SQL installation, drop that directory in it? Will it find it? I, I, yeah, I think the question that we're both trying to ask is, can you run two MySQL Ds at the same time watching two different directories? No, 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 no. I, I can, I can, if I take a virgin MySQL install, whether it's container or whatever, drop that directory in varlib MySQL and restart the MySQL daemon, will it find that database? I think, it, I mean, I, that's what I would try. That's what I'm kind of advocating that when I, ported over when I um, stood up my Redmine instance, I just copied over the my, var lib my SQL directory from the machine, my live machine into the VM, or, you know, that I was the turnkey VM that I was prototyping. And it was like, oh, whew, here's the MySQL database. Right, but, but you missed the point. In that case, you're just copying the entire MySQL over. I need to copy I need to take one database out of 20. Sure. Well, I mean, then, and, then after you copy the whole one, then you export, then you dump it. Right. So do you think if I drop that directory and I clean my SQL install, it should right. see it and then I can dump it from there? Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. I, I did not specify that second step. Okay. I, I agree with Stanford on that because it, it works fine with Docker and should work the same way there too. Okay, so so you're saying if I drop a directory into a, it, just the database directory into a clean uh, varlib MySQL, he should find it. Right, right. And what I what I was referring to was that uh, if you used the volume mapping in a Docker, um, like say a, like a Docker Compose YML, or just just doing it directly. Um, and you've got a, like a completely different database and you just got, you know, CP-R, the whole thing over into a new directory and mm -hmm. then map it to that directory. Yeah, and then you fire up MySQL D uh, uh, container. It'll just find it just fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was concerned because, you know, that's the data directory. It's not the actual MySQL directory. Anyway, I'll, I'll give it a try. Thanks. Yeah, but I think, and I think everything is relative to varlib MySQL. I don't think there's any config files in Etsy MySQL D. No, no. What, what I'm saying is I'm not doing anything with varlib MySQL. This is the directory under that that represents a separate database. Right, but what Stanford was saying was uh, grab the whole thing, 
in a in a brand new place and then uh, use my SQL dump right to dump just that one database to a text file and then go from there. That's what I think he was saying, right, Stanford? I missed that ad. I was answering the uh, other. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I was I was trying to uh, clarify or hopefully clear said, which is basically you you've copied the whole thing over, and then you fired up MySQL daemon, and then you use MySQL dump to grab just the database you want, and then you can blow it away, right? That copy. You don't right, need that copy. Right. I agree with okay. Ed. All right, let me give that a try. Thanks. And let's see. I wonder if anyone would raise their hand. Oh, look, Stanford has raised his hand. I bet Stanford has a question. Oh, wait, wait, this is, this is Stan. This is Stan, not Stanford. I've been trying to figure out how to hold up my hand on this stupid thing. I can't find the right button. You probably uh, can't sorry, you'll have to raise your hand to ask a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, so second icon whole... on the bottom right. It's it's re, uh, reactions. Yeah, I don't have that. Well, they um, need to update had... your client. Yeah, I bring up a list of participants that shows everybody else, and at the bottom of the participants list, there's a raise and lower hand button. Yes, that's where I'm, that's where mine is. Participants list, lower right hand side. Ooh. Oh my gosh, everybody's got their hand raised now. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, how many of those hands are real hand raise question in class? And how many are just testing their hand raise? So everybody put your hand down <laughs> unless you're asking a question. <laughs> okay, Stan Reichert. Uh, what you got there? What's the definition of a volume in Unix, Linux? I'm sorry, that was a little garbled. Definition of? Volume. What is the definition of the word volume in Linux or Unix? Volume. I know, what a, I know what a partition is. I know what a folder is, et cetera, et cetera. What is a volume? I think it's associated with the logical volume manager. So it's a layer of abstraction in between a partition and a file system. Okay. Take a bunch that of partitions, sounds... group them, glue them together and call it a volume group. Take a volume group and split it up into a bunch of logical volumes and then make file systems in each of those volumes. Okay, that would make sense if you're using logical volume manager. I've heard it use the word volume use otherwise, but maybe it's just so loosely used that there is no really good definition. Thank you. This is Ed. Uh, when I was referring to volume in the Docker instance, the word volume there refers to a mapping between the internal directory and the external directory that's on the host. So you're like on some host and you're running a Docker container, right? And you're saying, I tell the Docker container, hey, on my host file, I've got this directory and I want you to map that internally on the Docker container to this other place, right? And that's just called a volume, right? I don't know if it, I don't think it's related to logical volumes or anything like that. It's just what Docker calls it. Just a way to map from the internal to the host directory. But it, it's mapping disk space again. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I think you know. Basically, the whole Docker thing is running on. You know, it's based on ch root or whatever, right? So it's doing some kind of weird, like, symbolic link or something. You know, I don't really know. But if you write something from the container to that directory, right? It's going to show up on your host. Or if you write something on the host, it's going to show up in the container. So they're literally the same exact path, uh, or rather the same exact inodes or whatever, right, that are yeah. being referred to. They just have two different path names, or let's say roots to that path, I should say. Damn. It works. <laughs> All 
It took it took you less time to test it than it did for us to explain it to you. <laughs> and no, it it took less time to test it than it took me to to, to convince you what it was what the question was. That all sounds believable. I'm sure glad I'm recording this to go back and play it later so I can understand <laughs> it. <laughs> By the way, it took me quite a while to find out, find out how to lower my hand. <laughs> okay, so did, did everybody understand uh, Ed's explanation of volume? No, but it is recorded. No, but oh. it's recorded. Ed, oh, okay, Ed was recorded, yes. Okay, good. I, it sounded like a good explanation, Ed. Thank you. Oh, thank right. you. Um, Bob Hansen. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Um, is anybody using GitHub? Apparently, they changed something, so you, you have to have more than just your regular password to store stuff back on there. You need a secondary authorization, and I can't find a nice explanation someplace of what they want. If somebody could point something me. Something like a two-factor? Yeah, like, yeah. Like a, uh, a one-time password code or a time-based one to, time I password no clue, code? Or? I, have, I have no clue what it is. That's right. I can't find a, a nice, easy explanation that says, if I take my ID, which I have been had been using up until all this happened, that now I can't push anything back up to GitHub. It says, no, password ain't enough, Bella. And I can't figure out um, what else what else to give them? Somebody Have can find. Have you tried generating an SS, a SSH key and putting that on your account? Uh, if somebody will point me to a place where that's explained how to do that for them, I will. I'll be glad to read and try it. Somebody can give me a URL to look at. Well, maybe we can post it in discuss, and somebody will provide an answer there. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll need do to this. go change that. Or I need to go. I, mean, I guess most people aren't using GitHub very much. Yeah, maybe, occasionally. They may be using people may be using Git for their own stuff on their own ID and stuff, but they don't push it up to GitHub anymore. Uh, a, a lot of people abandoned GitHub when Microsoft started forcing everybody to log in. They're trying to. You know, Git, Git, Git Labs is is a common better is a more common platform nowadays. At least it's still independent. I mean, maybe I'll try to go get an ID on Git Labs instead. Okay, but if anybody, I'll I'll put a note on on discuss. And if anybody's got a place, to tell me, I'll, I'll appreciate it. something to read and see if I can figure it out. Thank you. Nice, good good discussion there. Thank you both. Well, thank you all three of you. Okay, uh, Tyler. Um, question of the general group. I'm changing my email address. How do you guys want me to tell you that? Just send it to discuss? Uh, good question. I guess if you don't mind it being public knowledge, discuss would work. Um, yeah. So or, if, you want to or send it, if not, send it to editor or send it to steercom at slug.org. Because I Depends unsubscribed I and resubscribed to Mailman with the new address. Okay. There was that big deal last week about GPG keys and Proton Mail ge generated one for me right out of the gate. The question is, is which one do I want you guys using? Um, second question. Stan, did you ever figure out the, uh, um, not Stan. My brain is on. Uh, Have you come up with the question yet? Uh, Lambert, you 
you were emailing me about the getting the mailman core image to work. Yeah, I, I did get that figured out. Okay. I got it working on my end after beating on it and learning you know, Docker. Um, the only other question I have is, do you guys want to talk, hear about me put together a talk about this uh, I have a project that I'm working through to convert a whole f uh, folder structure of data so saved into old email files into a database. Is that a subject that this group would be interested in? Ooh. I would think that so. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep, I well, think so. Really title and abstract. I basically have now coworkers on the other side of the planet and copying things in and out of Outlook is now a two to seven minute ordeal for them. Ooh. So I decided to make use a database in Django and abuse the hell out of Python. Which means that now I have to take years worth of emails, break them down and load them into a sequ into a Postgres database so that they can be searched and such. Oh my god, that sounds horrible. <laughs> now use a computer, it makes it much faster. I'm abusing the hell out of Python. <laughs> it will do 90% of the work. <laughs> I shall use the Python to package index to make it my job easier. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Oh, God. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that. That sounds real good. Uh, and definitely, uh, uh, I mean, if, if you wanted public knowledge, just go ahead and send uh, if your email address to discuss. But uh, uh, you know, if, if you haven't decided which one or you, you know, want one to be less less well known, send that to, to Steercom, and then uh, you know, we'll just keep it amongst the steering committee people. Uh, I probably yeah. should set up uh, RMDAIO as a domain for me and use that one instead because that's supposed to be my professional email. Yeah. All right. This session is being recorded. Everything you said is on the recording. And Google searches it all. What's yes. new? <laughs> By the way, I'm 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 I'm, I'm curious. Did you go to that uh, PGP uh, party no. last Friday? Or? I was feeling like garbage, so I decided not to. Okay. okay. But you did get motivated enough that you uh, uh, started getting in a huff about uh, PGP or GPG. No, I read about it, and then I said, "Did Proton Mail do this when I set it up?" And yes, yes, it did. I'm like, damn, I just need people that I want to send secret messages to to avoid the feds. There we go. I don't know where I'd get a whole bunch of yahoos like that that would not like Google reading my emails. If you're using Proton Mail, don't violate the Swiss laws because uh, they will send your information to the Swiss government. Which passes it on to the big five eyes. What um, I've got a Proton Mail account. What what violates a Swiss law? We don't know. We don't have any Swiss lawyers here. There's a discussion of it on this week's Security Now. So. You want to check it out? Check out this week's Security Now episode with Leo Laporte and Steve Gibson. Okay. One of the things to remember is that um, when I signed up for my uh, Proton Mail account, I didn't give them any personal information at all. They never asked for any. They said, pick your username, pick your password, and don't forget it. 
Because if you forget it, you're screwed. Yeah, and they also say everything's that's supposed true, to stay. That's true, but they probably it. have your IP address unless you're going through something like Tor or maybe a VPN or something. All that and, you know. You know what's funny? So you had to pay for the internet provider since I signed up. So that kind of screws that up. No, they totally, the way, I mean, they're, they're very for, big on privacy. I doubt they've kept, they keep that kind of information. Okay. They keep your IP addresses. Well, maybe so. That's why you use uh, Tor. Yeah. I think it's actually built into the client. Sounds like a good presentation. Actually, I mean, Lee did a nice presentation on Tor, what, three years ago, Lee? But, yeah, something uh, like that. And that, how you can set up your own Tor endpoint, you know, secure mm -hmm. endpoint. Yeah. Why don't you give that presentation again, Lee? I can do that. Um, anyway, for, for uh, uh, the, 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 the PGP key exchange party. Uh, that, that's an annual event that the uh, Arch Reactor people do. Uh, but uh, it, it, it kind of hit a nerve this year because you know, just in the last couple months, the, uh, uh, there was the announcement, the revelation that uh, 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 Microsoft Exchange servers that uh, some bad actor in the world uh, managed to basically you know, get get uh, access to just a whole bunch of Microsoft Exchange servers. And so there's, uh, you know, just scads and scads and scads of corporate February, mail. where that literally lit a fire under my, my messaging group. Okay. That was a royal pain in the rear end. Uh-huh. Because it literally broke my software. Oh. <laughs> The third or fourth patch that they put out there to make it so that the, you didn't have, because literally the it, the vulnerability lets you become system on the exchange box. Uh -huh. And three, it shoved everybody into just patch it. We don't care what breaks. Yeah. <laughs> and like the third or fourth patch, sometime in April, it's like. Yeah, our remote calls to exchange to make mailboxes for new people or remove mailboxes. Yeah, that's dead. God. Oh my. So yeah, this this yeah, aha experience of how people have let security go to hell. So anyway, uh, traveling on to other questions. Um, Ed Howland. You had a question, Ed? Okay. Uh, that's just more of an announcement. Can I do an announcement? Sure. Okay. Uh, just letting, uh, if you're not subscribed to the discuss list, now's a good time to subscribe to the discuss list. Uh, currently ongoing on the discuss list, amongst other things, really interesting topics, is the FizzBuzz Challenge. And the FizzBuzz Challenge is starting to heat up. And uh, we've gotten three submissions so far. Uh, one is from my evil twin, uh, which does not work, so it's not counted on the leaderboard. Uh, but we've got one from Chris, uh, I think it's Vic House. I think that's his name. And uh, Robert Sytek. So the, if the FizzBuzz Challenge is a challenge to exercise your programming muscles to get those logical juices flowing all you got to do is write a simple program that prints the numbers 1 to 100 but every time the number is divisible by 3 you print fizz every time it's divisible by 5 you print buzz every time it's divisible by both 3 and 5 you print fizz buzz and mm. that's it that's the entire challenge you can write it in any programming language you like from bash to ada to uh, zig to c sharp Perl, Python, Ruby, whatever. Um, you pick the language. There's no points for style. The uh, finish date is going to be October 1st. 
So I'll print all the uh, winners and or losers up on that date and stay tuned watching the leaderboard to see who's doing what and in what language. That's it. We should point out that people can go back to the archives of the uh, discuss board and and see pre the, the entire monthly's listing. Right? And the way you do that is you go into the same page where you would sign up for the discuss list and on there it, it says there's a way to uh, look at the previous postings and you put in the, the user ID and password that is listed on that page and then it will allow you to go back and look at previous monthly postings. Right. Right, and uh, so there's two. There's two posts. Well, there's three up there, but there's two postings, uh, one by Chris, by Robert, and uh, there's an additional um, extra credit. If you you can either just post your code, or you can uh, make it runnable in a Docker container. If you make it runnable in a Docker container, you get ten points. If you make it runnable from a single command line with Docker Run you get 20 points. So Chris was our first poster, and he did that, so he got the 20 extra points. So uh, Robert did it as well, but he did it in a completely different way. So even even though it was a completely different way, I still had to award him 20 points because uh, he, still, he still, you know, followed the rules. So anyway, so October 1st is the deadline, and uh, we will... Uh, Post another challenge up uh, soon after that. How many points if I do it in a single line of Perl? Oh, if you can do it in a single line of Perl, uh, you might be uh, moved up to the head of the head of the line. I uh, don't know. I haven't got any single line. Uh, I've gotten some people telling me that they've got single liners. Um, I'm trying to work right on now on a single liner bash only version, but uh, and I also have a single liner Ruby version that I'm working on. But if you can do it in Perl, that would be perfect in a one liner. So a single line of bash would be what, like a, a, a all bunch of pipe into pipe into pipe type, that's all one line? Yeah, actually I think uh, the, the single line for bash, the way I was planning on doing it was a little bit of a cheat. I was just gonna, you know, pipe seek SCQ into while into a while loop and then use semicolons for the uh, um, the do and the done part and then you know a bunch of uh, um, tests you got a uh, bunch of stuff in between those yeah. semicolons <laughs> right 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 so yeah stay tuned for that unless you want to try it yourself but uh, yeah, I'm looking for uh, Perl I'm looking for uh, basic, um, uh, I don't care what language you want to try, JavaScript, uh, C, anything, it doesn't matter. Just get your juices flowing. Whatever your favorite language is, give it a shot. Excellent. And you know that what will happen is that when you go interview for your next job, they might ask you to do that. You'll be one step ahead. And, and you won't even have to, to reprove it because you'll get an official embossed certificate uh, from uh, the uh, FizzBuzz Challenge. <laughs> yes, well, we'll have, to, we'll have to see about getting an embossed certificate. Maybe just a printout with a fancy <laughs> award. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Ed. This looks like fun. So, cool. And now... To our main question of the evening, <laughs> main series of questions, possibly, we're going to turn it over to Stanford Baldwin. Uh, so far, I only have two questions. I'll start with the simple one. Um, I was thinking, well, be, my laptop started to die, and before I could breathe life back into it, I got the wild idea of going to EPC and getting um, a, a Lenovo uh yoga you know a tablet a, a laptop that folds itself into a tablet my question is 
Does anybody have any recommendations on whether or not – place your bets. Do you think there will be any Linux distro that will recognize the touch screen on that tablet? I'd say. Oh, it's silence. I have, this is Stan. I have, I've read that some Linux distros will recognize the touch screen. However, I don't remember specifically which ones it might be. Yeah, and I'm, am I even asking the question properly? Is it more of a distro issue, a kernel issue, or a window manager issue? Uh, not, none of the above, Stanford. It's a device issue. That the device touch, driver. That, well, not necessarily a driver, but that the, the touchscreen device will detect as a device uh, either PCI or however you have to do. And once you find the device I name, uh, you know, look for that device uh, set up or whatever distro you want to use. Oh, so put, do something on, put, put some, put some rescue CD on there and ask it what its device name is and then go search the web for which distros support this device. Yeah, you don't need a rescue. I mean, if it's detected, it'll be in your LSPCI or PCI device or USB device or however it detects. But I mean, you got to boot off of something to ask that question. Oh, I thought you've installed it already. You said it doesn't work. No, I went I went there to make a purchase and they didn't have the one I, that I wanted, but they loaned me one on the display shelf and I booted a, rest, a, a live CD that I brought with me and it didn't work. So I should have taken the opportunity to do an, what'd you call it, LS, um, LSPCI? LSPCI or LSUSB. Um, have you tried asking Tony? I did. I, Tony was, I, I don't know, he was busy uh, playing uh, finger mop on his phone and didn't have time. Actually, he, he, he chased down the hardware that I needed, but he did not have a, a software answer for me. Uh. Or you can try looking for that generic model touchscreen in your distro. Yeah, I mean, I guess I I think I even tried to say what distro. I mean, I went to Google and said what you know, Lenovo G4 uh, um, Yoga Yoga G4 or whatever it is. What, you know, what what version of Linux works with this? And all you got is a bunch of idiots saying, I really like this distro because the interface is sexy. Like I didn't ask you if it was sexy. I asked you if it would work. <laughs> okay, so the LSPCI or LSUSB, and then go search for that. Make sure that that driver. So now, help me with the next step. After I find out what the device is, what's the question that you ask to say? Is this device built into this distro? It's not built into a distro. You have to figure out how to configure that for your window manager. But you need to know what the device is first. Otherwise, you know, there there could be a hundred different touchscreen models out there. You need to know what's being detected. Yeah. I will say that in the past my brother has an all in one computer, which is a touchscreen. Mm -hmm. D or Dell or I think whatever whatever. And when I when I loaded Zorin on it first, it didn't recognize. And then it then the the wife called and said it's broken and so I went back two years later and lo and loaded Linux Mint and it detected the touchscreen. So, but the Linux Mint that I took with me to EPC did not detect the touch. You know, we're talking about, you know, two different pieces of hardware. <laughs> but usually well, the thing is that EPCs, those, those computers are kind of old. You know, a modern distro ought to have all that old, ought to recognize all that old hardware. Yeah, but it, it could be something that's not, you know, it's, it's uncommon. Yeah. In which case, doing the distro install might pull a driver properly where it's whereas it's not there in the live version i see what you mean right okay next question that, that's it by the way that, that, that's a great observation that lee just made the, the difference between doing the full install and the uh, thank you that's great in fact i think in my search i found out i found somebody who said the other way around that is whatever it, is live cd work and then when he tried to install it it didn't work so they are different. 
it, you know, it can work for you or against you, but they are different. The next question is system D. Oh, I've been in system D hell all week. Um, who's got enough experience? The GPS demon, great, wonderful thing, but the GPS demon just says, oh, there's a bunch of USB ports here. Let me walk all through them and try and find out which one the GPS is connected to. It's like, don't you dare. I got other people using those other USB ports. You stay off of them. <laughs> uh, Stanford, the magic word is UDEV. Yeah, well, the UDEV, I mean, so I did. I wrote some UDEV rules, and I wrote okay. a little Perl script to, to, to build my own little device. So dev GPS now points to the right USB driver that I want it to point to. Now, my application starts in parallel with the GPSD. It's a race condition at boot time to get not just UDEV, but the, the Perl script that sorts out the UDEV and my application, which is dependent upon the GPSD, to all start up in the correct, proper, wait for each other order. What I learned today was that requires and after are two different keywords that have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> requires means this this you know that foo requires bar and if for some if somebody stops bar i'm going to go ahead and stop foo also <laughs> and after just means yes i'm going to start bar first then i'm going to start foo and i'm going to let them race to see which one finishes what i really need is <laughs> Bar needs to wait for foo to complete before bar starts. And I don't know the keyword for that one. I don't know that there's a keyword. I would. De here's dependency, little little de 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 dependency doesn't wait. Yeah, here's another little trivia bit. It's in one of the help pages, it says these system D. Um, config files are not executed, they're parsed. <laughs> and <Ooh. they're> in... <laughs> it sounds like you're parsing the language of the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's my whole point. System D is, <laughs> is not an executable. It's a whole nother world with its own dialect. You have to speak elfin or dwarfish or whatever to parse that i mean we we definitely need a lesson on how to speak system d wow have you looked up after um yeah i, I mean after it, it, it just said that i mean there's an after or before you put the after in one or the before in the other but it was and it, it kind of recommended that you use them in parallel that you say if you want this to start after, then say after. But if you also want it to be dependent upon it, then also use requires. And there's a difference between requires and wants. And wants is looser than required. And I think the point is, is that the requires will, when the, when the, parent, when the dependent one, when the independent one dies, the required one, or the one that requires it will also die. Whereas wants just means um, I want it to start first, but if it dies, I'll keep running. <laughs> but, but both of them are just starting at the same time. It's not waiting for the one that I require to get Stanford. far along enough in its process to be able to provide what I require. Stanford, after does what you want. Um, the after... The ordering directive oh, after and after wait on the first one. Yeah, that's what you want, isn't it? It is, but it don't no after just means the thing is that it they're all there. It it, it started a millisecond after. It's not. It, I don't. I don't think that after means after this other one finishes. It means after you kick this other one in the pants and let it start first.
Hmm. Well, after looks like it's supposed to do what you want, but uh, yeah. you know, like like you say, it it's it generated a race condition because even though the service is finished started, it's not ready for the next one. Right. Stanford does the uh, um, thing do a log file. The one before does it do a log file of any kind? Um, you can see in var log messages the order that it starts them up in. And sure no, enough, I meant yeah, the thing you're waiting for the other one to like, oh. you know, uh, e equalize or equilibrium or whatever, right? So it settles down and it's ready to go. Let's say there, that, uh, it, the, let's say it touches some lo some finished file. I'm finished. <laughs> Yeah, or does it just write anything to a log file that says it's ready? You know, for example, minus when it starts up, right, in its log file, it says uh, accepting connections on port 3306, right? Okay, and when you see like that, that yeah. in the log file, you can start sending connections to it, right? So the reason I brought that up was you could use the expect program uh, to uh, look for that message. And then, you know, wait on starting your program uh, until after the expect program finishes. Hey, Stanford, <clears throat> on, the, on the service you need to delay, in the service stanza for system D, you can use an exec start pre equals uh, like slash bin slash C sleep slash five or 10. Oh, a, a pre and just put in a sleep. Right, exec start pre, and in, in, yeah. in your in your system D service stanza. I that that is the cheap way out. I may try that. Because well, but I mean that's that's defined in system D, so. Yeah, that's a, that's a good suggestion. I mean, it's not it's not foolproof because it's it's non-deterministic. You hope right. that the other one finishes in that amount of seconds. <laughs> Well, the, the other way to do it was set up a set up a semaphore somewhere, but I'm not sure that that capability is built into System D. You'd have to do it yourself. Yeah, it's like I said. The problem was I was having is that the default GPSD was was battling for which you you TTY to use, and when I wrote a Perl script to to sort that out for it, the Perl script, you know. Perl, it has a list of TTYs in the Perl script talks to the first one, then it talks to the second one, then it talks to the third one. And as it goes, it makes notes and then it says, okay, make a, make a, make a meaningful symbolic link to this first one, make a different meaningful symbolic link to this second one. And, and that takes a little while, you know, that takes more than, than microseconds to achieve. And so you have to give that bad boy time to finish. So you're right in, in front in, in as a, pre-exec or whatever, like you said, to the GPSD, I need to say pre-exec, sleep a bunch of times because we're in no hurry to get our GPS location. <laughs> well, that's that, that's a workaround. I mean, the, the question still stands of, yeah, what is the right way in system D to say, I absolutely positively need to have this one finished, done, complete, and put to bed before I start. <laughs> By the way, I think that is the only time anyone has ever said, I really don't need to know, you know, my GPS location. <laughs> I don't need to know it in a hurry. Well, could hurry. you just serialize it from a script or something? I mean, I, but I did uh, the opposite of what you said. I was running the TTY script from Etsy and Nip.d, so that so that System D didn't know anything about it. So the first thing I had to do was say, well, okay, let's bring the uh, Perl script into System D, <laughs> so that we can be begin to have dependency control here. But this whole System D multi-threaded boot is a uh, quagmire. I had another one too. I, I just the one application is dependent upon ETH one. Great. So, but the application says dependent upon network. So the network starts and it starts ETH one two three zero one two three. Only when two and three don't start, but zero and one do, the network says failed, incomplete. 
Therefore, the one that's dependent upon ETH1 says, the whole network didn't start, therefore I'm not starting. So the solution to that one was, well, let's just stub out two and three so that they're, you know, that you only need zero and one to make the network healthy, not, you know, I, I had let two and three dangle in the DHCP mode or whatever, instead of, instead of turned off at boot time, I had boot and get a DHCP address or something to that effect. And it was like, well, I booted, but I couldn't get it. There was I talked to the DHCP server, and he never, and and so I I didn't I didn't finish fully initialized, and so I'm not really up. Zero and one are healthy. Who cares about two and three? Well, the other guy's dependent upon the whole network. So it's it, it, and it's and again, it wouldn't be that it was dependent upon it if you could just say. Go run network first. Don't require it, but just but just start after it, and after it's had enough time to finish. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, one of these days I. I think you're right. I think the pre-exempt sleep is my cheap way out tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, at, at least I should get you working if you can pick a delay that doesn't, you know, that covers you. Uh, I have the same problem with my celery daemons, but it's more of um, the var slash run directory doesn't get created. I need to get it to do exec pre to create that with the um, right permissions. Actually, Lee, what I need to do is I need to abandon that whole Perl script as and, and just make that the pre-exec run. Put, take, take the part of the Perl script who's responsible for building the, the, the GPS device, extract that from the Perl script into its own script, and make that a pre to the GPSD. I think I follow you. Yeah, that sounds like a good option. Where do you guys usually stick those in the uh, in the file system? With scripts? Yeah, the scripts that. Yeah, in this case, I put in user local S bin because it's a system script. It's managing devices. It has to run as root. Put it in user local, but I put it in not in bin or user bin or S bin, but in user local S bin. Okay. It, it's my personal. I mean, I, I, Carl and I put them in different places. Carl, Carl's semi-retired. Now I get to put them wherever I want. <laughs> I was, but yeah, I need to write a bash script that will go ahead and force the because every time my celery demons start up to 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 on a reboot, it goes and says, "What folder is under var run?" However, let me, let me warn you of this. Um, it's, not, it's not a problem that slash user is not available at boot time, because everything's on slash now. Even user is on slash. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, there is, and there is no bin and SD. Everything that used to be in slash is now in user. That, you know, Etsy's in, well, Etsy's still in Etsy, but bin is in user bin. <laughs> SBIN's in user SBIN. Nothing's in slash anymore, but now user mm -hmm. is part of slash. So it's all available at boot time. However, the path for system D is very minimal <laughs> and does not contain user local S bin. So you do that by in your in your in your dot service file you say um, environment file equals <laughs> and you go with a little you know bash RC file that, that says I'm gonna need all these environment files defined. <laughs> In, I'm going to need all these variables, and you don't define the variables in the dot .service file. You define them over in Etsy systemd, pro, you know, you know um, application.conf, <laughs> and then you and then and then you take the, the name of that and make it your environment file inside the definition of the service. It's just very complicated. It's a whole new language. It's annoying. That's what it is. What was uh, what was wrong with init.d? Well, it was single threaded. That's what was wrong with, it. which was fine with me. 
on a, on a related note, Stanford, uh, the Docker Compose stack, uh, I had a similar problem, and I I found there was this little uh, uh, key value pair called depends on, and so you can say that one of the containers depends on another container, right? And mm -hmm. so I thought, oh, great, I'll get the Redmine container to depend on the uh, MySQL container, and I'll get my third container to depend on the Redmine container. Well, that worked, except for, and that just tells Docker Compose what order to start them in. And that, that part actually worked. However, again, as I mentioned, it doesn't have anything at all to do with, you know, has it equalized or has it, you know, is it, is it ready? You know, yeah. when you start MySQL up for the first time, right, it does a whole bunch of stuff. And it's like, uh, hey, you know, I'm going to take like 35 seconds before I'm done, like initializing database files and directories and stuff like that. So uh, I could not rely on that depends on right to do anything, which is why I, I resorted to um, um, implementing an expect script, right, to mm. search for a specific string in a log file. And when I saw that specific string in the log file, I go, oh, OK, now it's ready. Now I can do the thing that I wanted to do. So, so I'm going to, yeah, I was going to make a comment, but I'll ask you this question first. So that expect script is where in the, the, the it's in the, the guy who's already depending upon, foo is, de or bar is depending upon foo. So bar has to have the expect script to say, the, the, bar, la the bar launcher has to say, but don't start bar until this expect script sees its success. Right, right. The, the final container in my stack was itself a bash script, right? So uh, the first thing I did was like I like set up some environment variables and I set up some paths and some stuff like that, right? And then I said, okay, I actually did have to put a sleep in there. And I think that was for something else, for something in the container itself. But then after that was done, right? I still couldn't depend on my SQL from being finished yet especially if it was run for the first time. And so I, right then in that same bash script, that's when I did the expect. So yeah, you're right. If, if it's bar depends on foo and bar, the command that bar is running is a bash script in this case or whatever, right? Some part in there had that expect script in there, which called this expect thing or whatever, you know, expect its own language, right? It's got its own file. So it called that, and that was looking for a specific uh, map to volume file, uh, to, which is a log file, and it's looking for a specific string in there. And when it saw that string, it says, oh, okay, now I can exit out of expect and then continue on with the rest of the bash script. That makes yeah, sense? Um, no, you know, it, and one of the other comments that I read in, I don't know, in one of the the help pages or whatever seem to indicate that, yeah, it, 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 you do the requires and you do the after. And so all that, all that, you know, bar requires foo. Okay. But it, but they kind of left it as an exercise to the user. Now, if bar requires foo, it's bar's job to start and die, start and die, start and die and keep retrying. I'll start foo for you, but you need to keep retrying until foo is ready. And that was unacceptable to me, but it's like what you said. It's either you either put an expect script up front or you just put it in a, in a in a loop that says, try again, try again, try again. Right, right. That was that was an alternative that I considered. Um, the other the thing I, expect I think there was, there was another keyword in the service file that was something like, um, it was something like stay running after exit and and then there's another one called forking. I mean, it, it there is some there is some keywords there. Like, okay, I'm going to start this service for you. Now, is this just a service that runs and dies and does its job, and we're not waiting for it, or is this a service that's a demon and it actually runs and stays running and and whatever? You know, so the first thing we need to be able to do is understand that. You know, there are two classes of of, of start of services. 
services that services that run to completion at boot time and services that continue running after boot time. And for the ones that run to completion, then, then you're right. We're looking for some keyword that says, um, yeah, the, the service that I'm requiring is, is going to finish. So wait till it finishes. <laughs> and I'm just kind of surprised. I mean, I, I, that's probably built into their, um, their grammar, their, their language. They're the system D language part language parser. I just don't know what all the keywords are. There's also the wait command. And so like if it if the one thing you're waiting on is let's say a file to appear, you can use the wait command, I think. Um, that's just a regular bash command though. So you can look into that. But it only depends well, on is... if it touches a file or something. That's a good well, that's the whole point. The point is it's waiting for it to to it the the, the GPS daemon needs to wait for the Perl script to create a well-named device name, you know, a, uh, that belongs to the GPS daemon and no one else. <laughs> By tradition, 10-minute warning. So yeah, it's called dev GPSD. And so if I just say wait for dev GPSD to appear, yeah, I could put that in, but the wait is is part of a system, system where, tell me what you, where did you find this wait documented and what was its syntax? Is it a Unix command or is it a system D command? Oh God, now you've got me. <laughs> like I was like looking into it and I forgot where everything was, where it was, but yeah, I think it's just a program you can either install or it's already in there. But let me see if I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Give me a minute. It looks well, to be a standard you all for your patience. I hope you, I hope you all are terribly afraid of system D at this point. Since no, we, 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 we're, we're not we're, we're, we're not as convoluted <laughs> as you. I'm kind of liking the journal control to look at the journals. Uh, by the way, Stanford and Ed, weight appears to be a bash function. So weight is a bash function, not a not a keyword in the system D language. Well, at least there is a bash function on three different systems I checked right now. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I've seen what is wait. What does it? I think wait waits. You do it. You do a. You put a bunch. You create a bunch of children. You put them in the background and you do a wait, and wait causes the parent to wait until all of its children are dead. I think that's the definition of the bash wait command. Yeah, I just checked that. You're right. It is. Uh, I think there. I might be confusing it with another command. Possibly wait for. I don't know. I'm yeah. looking it up right now, but I'm not yeah, not gets, finding it. That gets back to the high command says it and I waits came for up a with. process to change state. Yeah, it's the. Yeah, it's yeah. looking for the uh, pids, ch children pids, to uh, you know either exit or uh, start up or whatever. Yeah. Now, in my case, like I said, I think my solution is to create a, a, a tighter script that goes and makes the device that I need and run that as a pre to the GPSD. But in your case of I want they're, they're not they're not things that run and die. They're things that run and reach a level of acceptability. How do you detect that? And that one, I can't even think about that because in my case, I just want to, I just want you to wait until your predecessor is finished. You want to wait until your predecessor is healthy. Gee, try to define that. <clears throat> How would it's you a conundrum. How would you do it under init.d? Why is this a system D problem, Ed? Oh, I don't know about init.d. I mean, init.d is just a, like, we just run in bash scripts, right? I mean, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, they're just like, you know, serial step-by-step. Step. 
Yeah, I mean, and yet, and, and so you would start MySQL, and then you would start Redmine, and then you would start your app. But it's like, yeah, they, they just they just start in order. But it's like because they background, right? Start MySQL and background. Otherwise, you're you're gonna hang, and you're not gonna start anything else. Well, I noticed that when uh, you get the standard off the shelf Redmine container from Docker, and you get the standard off the shelf MySQL container from Docker right and you just have just those two right and they're and you start them up uh redmine does this weird thing where it kind of like it keeps a, attempting to connect to mysql and it keeps failing but it just keeps retrying until it finally until it finally and that, succeeds and that's what i was saying that that would seem to be the language that was indicated in the it says a, a, a once or a require just like i'll start it for you but it's your job to wait until it's ready. <laughs> right, right. So I thought that was kind of ugly. That's just why I, why I went the expect script away because it was more deterministic, as you mentioned. Okay. I mean, it's it's polling versus interrupt driven, right? Just right. keep polling until you succeed, or no, go right, go run a task that will interrupt me when it's done. <laughs> mm hmm. I mean, you could write All a... right. Oh, okay. I'm just going to suggest, Stanford, is there a possibility you could put a, a shim between the two? You know, you start the one, which is the Perl script, right? And then you start the second one, which is the GPS daemon. Is that correct? Yep. And is it possible to put something between those two? Um. You know, I get that's um, you're right. Like just <laughs> Perl, three three demons, Perl script, Perl script delay, Perl script delay, and GPSD or whatever, and have and have the one require the other, require the other, and just and have the and have the one who's delay just supposed to eat up enough time until he's ready. Yeah, that's. Now I was just trying to brainstorm something there. Uh, you know where the um... no, he put me on the right answer. It's a it's a you know think differently. Stop, you know, go back yeah. to the drawing board. Don't say, don't write one script that builds all your device drivers. Go write a separate script for each device driver and make it a precursor to everything that's dependent upon that device driver. Yeah, that's that's a possibility. Could you use uh, some kind of external lock file? Um, like I said, there's all different kinds of cases here. You know, like I said, Ed's case is he wants to make sure it's ready. My case is I want to make sure it's finished. <laughs> but you're right. That, that's a whole other thing. Locking and semaphore and stuff like I uh, shared memory. It's uh, these are these are not new problems. I mean, interprocess communication and and uh, is is not. <laughs> And, and, and locking and race conditions are this race conditions are nothing new. They've been there since <laughs> uh, since what since multitasking, right? I mean, I guess bread, breadboarded old uh, old fashioned breadboarded circuit boarding is the first, you know, punch cards with patch which pat with patch cords on the front panel. They were truly single threaded. There were no race conditions. <laughs> but as soon as we got the general pur purpose CPUs and started multitasking and multi-threading we came up with a whole set of problems that that people good uh, computer scientists found answers to <laughs> it's just like i said they've written this this grammar for system d and i haven't gone and bought the book system d for dummies okay one minute huh stan You know, with the, uh, uh, when did System D come out? Four years ago? Five years ago? I don't know. It's, it, it's, a, it's a bridge from Red Hat 6 to Red Hat 7. I don't know that that pinpoints it at all. but well, it, it, Whatever the year was, I, I just remember at the time, you know, we were back then asking, oh, God, why do we have to make this so complicated? And here we are 
few years later, and it's still just so complicated. <laughs> so. But like Stan said, the journal is kind of nice. You know, go find this. And the first, the other thing, didn't it, didn't they read um, Brian Kernahan's book or or uh, oh no, I forget Ken Thompson's book? No Unix command should be longer than two characters. Oof. Why would you spell a command S Y S T E M C T L? Yeesh. Uh, uh, abbreviated S C, because there is no other S C command in the Unix lexicon. Oh my gosh. And the same thing with J O U R N A L C T L. There is no J C to conflict with in the Unix lexicon. Mm hmm. I, 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 you know, you know those two two letter commands were just because of the uh, teletypes. Uh, they were printed on paper, printed on paper, right? That's why they were two letters. Right. And, and it isn't bad enough. S Y S C T E M C T L. That's just the first word. Now we've got another word of what you want to do. And then another word of who you want to do it to. So now, luckily, the tab key works in all three of those fields. But still, <laughs> can't you just use an alias? SC and JC. And and Steve Stegman's TM for TMUX or whatever. Well, this sounds like a, a, a good place to at least informally wrap up. Uh, and we certainly, we were kind of making fun, but uh, it, 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 it wasn't uh, being done in a mean way, we hope, uh, because we knew that when, when Stanford uh, put forth his uh, uh, comments and questions, that would be some good mind-bending stuff. And that's what we're here for, is to have our minds bent and uh stanford you lived up i mean <laughs> you brought some some heavy stuff to the table here good good yeah. good talk good talk this reminds me of the old days of playing stump the chuck <laughs> yes we gotta get chuck to come back sometime um, yeah why can't he come in remotely yeah yeah so and, I, think, uh, I think he's scared of us oh <laughs> I anyway, mean. also, jumping back, Steve Stegman, a big thanks to Steve. Uh, uh, he picked up the ball about a week and a half ago and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this presentation on TMUX. And, uh, so uh, uh, nice job. Uh, good, good presentation. Got us into some, some interesting uh, facets of that. So, uh, and uh, I think everybody in the meeting right now is uh, uh, long timers, so I think you all know uh, Steve and Stanford and uh, uh, all of our other questioners. So thanks to everybody from everybody. It's been a good meeting and uh, a lot of familiar faces here tonight. Dave, your mic is muted, but we see you waving good night. <laughs> good night, Dave. <laughs> thanks. Night, Dave. Robert, good night to you. Thank you. And, uh, Hey Robert, are we still we still in holidays, right? This is still uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, or is that already over? Well, that's pretty much already over for all intents and purposes. Okay, okay, it was a multi-day holiday though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I missed it a little bit or so. Yeah. Talk later. To you later. <laughs> so, uh, uh, all righty. Doctor. Thanks. And by the way, closing down the recording at some point, uh, this was the uh, Wednesday, 8th of September, 2021, the uh, monthly general meeting of SLUG. Uh, TMUX was our only uh, formal presentation this evening. TMUX was being done by Steve Stegman. And... Uh, after that, we just went to uh, a long question and answer period. So, uh, but we had a good time tonight. So, thank you all for coming and good night. Yep. Take care.
Bye, Steve. Bye, Gary. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Uh, should I go ahead and kill the session? I guess so. Thank you, Bob. You had, had some good points tonight, good questions, and good answers. Good night, Bob. Bob may be away from his uh, microphone, but I'm going to end this meeting for all. All right. Good night. Thanks.